PFT's own Mike Florio back here on the show. How are you, Mike? Doing great, Rich. How are you, pal? I am doing better. So, uh, what's the uh, what's 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 the latest on the Deshaun Watson uh, trade? Is that popping? Is that the popping out of the toaster? Calm before the storm. What do you think? The calm before the storm. I think. I don't know. I've been trying to rattle the cages a little bit to see what may be going on today. Haven't heard anything back yet. The owners are in New York City. Stephen Ross was asked about it and wisely said nothing. The Dolphins owner can't say anything about a player under contract with another team unless he ends up potentially finding himself in trouble for tampering. So, you know, he'll be in the room with Cal McNair, the owner of the Texans, David Tepper floating around, the Panthers owner, and the Dolphins and the Panthers continue to be the two teams that people are paying the most attention to. I got it 75-25 Dolphins over Panthers, but I think it's going to get done by next Tuesday. You know, I don't know this, but I'm surmising based upon the various things I've heard, the things that people like Nick Casario, the Texans GM, and David Culley, the Texans coach, have said this season. They talk about taking it all day to day. I think at some point, somebody, now they could renege on this, but I think somebody told Watson they were trading him before the deadline. And I'm going to be surprised, very surprised at this point if it doesn't go down. What do you mean somebody told him just like, hey, just sit tight? Bear with us. Don't show up and say, here I am, I want to play. Because you can't put a guy on paid leave unless he's okay with it. That was the blowback to the Terrell Owens situation from 05 when the Eagles eventually sent him home for the rest of the year and say, we'll send you your paycheck, just get the hell out of here. Keyshawn Johnson had that happen to him a few years earlier. You can't do that anymore. you got to have grounds to suspend a guy without pay. You can do it for up to four weeks, and that's it. You can't just pay a guy to go home. So he's got to be on board with it. So... You know, if they don't trade him by next Tuesday, and I'm not saying that he's going to do this, but in theory he could show up on Wednesday and say, I'm ready to play some football, and that's not what they want. Right. So what's why isn't he on the commissioner's exempt list already? Is it because the Texans have him on the Texans' exempt list and he's got them uh, on the Deshaun Watson exempt list, you know, um, or or there's no grounds for it just yet, which clears the way for a trade? What about it's that? a situation where make no decision until you absolutely positively have to. And I've had this told to me a couple of different times when I've poked around with the league office because the Dolphins actually contacted the league late August when this all first bubbled up because it looked like it was going to happen. There was that moment where the Texans had to decide, are we going to actually devote a roster spot to Deshaun Watson and have 52 guys on the team? What are we going to do with Deshaun Watson? Well, if you trade him, You got your 53-man roster free and clear. And it almost happened then. Texans wanted more than what the Dolphins were willing to do, but the league made it clear then. We're not telling you anything we haven't decided. We're not going to decide until we have to. And whatever the circumstances are, Rich, at the time he's traded, whatever is going on with the criminal cases, there are 10 criminal complaints that have yet to be presented officially to a grand jury. They will be at some point. Maybe he'll be indicted. Maybe he won't. We don't know how that's going to play out. But then there were the 22 civil cases. They almost settled them a few months back. The talks broke down over the issue of whether or not the settlements would be confidential. You don't get to that point if you don't have a loose understanding as to what the payment would be. That's not how it works. You know, you don't jump forward to other issues on the docket if you don't have an understanding of what the payment will be. So those deals could be done at any time. 22 cases could be resolved like that. And if the commissioner is considering what to do with Deshaun Watson, and he's resolved the 22 cases to the satisfaction of the 22 women who have made their complaints, that may counsel against putting him on paid leave while they wait to see what happens with the, the criminal situation. But at some point, the dust settles on the legal stuff, and that's when Watson faces a potential suspension without pay, like what happened to Ben Roethlisberger in 2010. He was sued once. He was accused another time, never charged with a crime, but he ended up being suspended six games, reduced to four. I think that Whoever gets Deshaun Watson has to expect at some point he's going to be suspended without pay for the, the loose understanding of six games. And also, he's the one back in you know the spring who was insisting on having no confidentiality, right? It's not like he's the one saying, I'm going to settle everything and nothing will ever get out. He wants everything public. At least that's what he was saying then. Has that stance changed in your estimation or no? Because that's another thing a team that's going to want uh, to acquire and would want to know, like, you know, what is going to come out, right? Like, what are we going to now own uh, through acquiring this player, right? The, the usual stance that the party who is writing the check will take in a case like this is to insist on confidentiality because whether it's a corporation, 
whoever. Yeah, and, and usually it's a corporation. I mean, you know, most of the cases are brought against somebody with money yes. or an insurance policy. Otherwise, the lawyer's wasting his or her time. They always told us in law school there's three things, liability, damages, and collectability. You can have a great case. And you can put on the blackboard, if they have blackboards anymore, all sorts of dollars that were lost. But if you can't get any of it, it doesn't matter. It's a waste of your time. So the corporations that end up being sued, they don't want people to find out how much they paid to make a case go away because that's an invitation for more of the same. So they always want confidentiality. Watson didn't want it here. His lawyer, Rusty Harden, has fought against confidentiality. The lawyer for the plaintiffs wanted confidentiality. And that sends a message that whatever the amount is going to be, it's not all that much grand scheme of things. And the lower the amount, the easier it is to create the perception that he just just had his reckoning on this, gave the individuals some form of compensation, but ultimately not the kind of payment he would make if he was guilty of some sort of heinous conduct. And I think that's an important distinction, that he's the one that's saying I want all of this to be open because it it is almost always the other way around. But you think one week from today we're going to see Deshaun Watson in a different uniform and and then he will be ready to play? Like, let's just say it's Miami in in their week nine contest. It's entirely possible. Yeah, against the Texans. It's entirely possible he goes. It's entirely possible. Now, how long does it take to get him ready? I don't know. Will he be put on paid leave? We don't know. I, I don't think he will be, but we just don't know. The league hasn't sat down to make a decision. Now, they've interviewed a lot of the individuals who have made their complaints about Deshaun Watson. And, you know, there were some comments from Tony Busby, the lawyer who represents the 22 individuals, that they thought they were disrespected by the league and, and, or by the investigators. And, you know, sometimes that happens when you're asked tough questions about your version of events and you don't like being pushed and you don't like holes in your story being challenged and you start to think they don't believe me and they're just, you know, they're just asking tough questions. And if they don't like tough questions, when they get questioned by Rusty Harden in their depositions and at trial, it's going to be a hundred times worse. But that, that made me wonder whether or not they came out of that interaction getting the sense that the league maybe didn't believe them the way that they thought the league would or should. So maybe the league isn't all that troubled, and maybe they will let him play. But, you know, if he's physically ready, if they can get him up to speed, in theory he could play as soon as week nine. But, boy, that's a lot to ask for, especially if the trade doesn't happen until next Tuesday. Now, if it happens today, mm-hmm. tomorrow, you got a little extra time to get him ready for week nine. And, and, and uh, that's why I won't be surprised if it happens – this week if i'm casario i delay it to the last possible second i don't want to see it. i don't want to see him oh you don't beat. want to see him week nine. No. Oh, you're absolutely right you know? not, not that they have a great chance of winning the game anyway but you don't want yeah, sean watson not. for his first game with a new team to be sticking it to to your team wow mike florio pro football talk here on the rich eisen show walk me through the protocol that Devonte adams is going to have to go through to potentially get on the field on Thursday, even though that appears highly unlikely. Yeah, vaccinated player tests positive, and the vaccinated players get tested once a week. If you're positive, you have to have two negatives at least 24 hours apart. And from Monday to Thursday, that's a tall order. Now, we haven't seen any news of further positives today. They split the teams up into three different chunks for the weekly test. Most important players would be, I assume, as early as possible, so you have a chance of turning it around. But I don't think there's been anybody who was vaccinated who tested positive who was back within five or six days. They've all missed at least one game, whether it's a coach or whether it's a player. So I'd be stunned if Devontae Adams is available on Thursday night, and they don't have defensive coordinator Joe Barry either. The question is between now and Thursday, will there be more who test positive? You know, people have asked me, Rich, well, is there a chance the game gets postponed? I don't get the impression the league has any appetite whatsoever this year to delay any game for any reason, and I don't know what the magic number is between 11 healthy players right. and 46, but somewhere in there, you know, there's a minimum that they'll go forward with. But when you've got 69 total guys available, it's going to take a lot to get to the point where a team would get some sort of a dispensation to not proceed with a game. Well, I mean, last year without a vaccine, if you remember Thursday night, Green Bay took on San Francisco, and San Francisco was, you know, maybe pulling somebody from – you know, uh, their their training staff to go suit up as a wide receiver. I mean, I remember that. That was 
that was wild. But the league still went ahead and made them play. You know, the Broncos versus the Saints. I I, I don't know that that would be a, that would be a surprise to me. Um, what about what is speaking of San Francisco? Uh, what is, I'll just open it up. What, what's happening there? What do you what are you hearing about about the coach and about the, the quarterback and about Trey Lance and this team that's two and four right now? And we're already talking about how two and five Seattle, the, the division's history. Um, that's becoming an object that's not nearly as close as they'd like to appear in the rearview mirror of Arizona and, and Los Angeles. What's going on with the 49ers? You know, it's amazing. It occurred to me last night when the Seahawks lost to the Saints that the Seahawks and the 49ers had that epic last game of the season, game number 256 on NBC to end the 2019 season with the number one seed in the balance yeah. in the NFC. And now the 49ers are 2-4 and four and the Seahawks are 2-5. and five less than two years later. It just shows you how quickly things can change. And with the 49ers, I personally think that they are scarred by the fact that they passed on Patrick Mahomes in 2017 and that they said no thank you to Tom Brady in 2020 when he wanted to come home and play for the 49ers. They're like, no, we're good with Jimmy Garoppolo. They saw both of those guys playing against each other in Super Bowl 55, and I just think they, they, they got a little desperate and they outsmarted themselves. I think they would have been in on Matthew Stafford if they'd had the chance. That deal got done before they even knew what was going on. They made the call to get Aaron Rodgers the night before the draft, even though they'd already given up three first-round picks to get in position, two first-round picks plus the 12th overall to get in position to take quarterback with number three. And then they end up taking a guy who everyone regards as a project. Like, okay, we, we need an upgrade over Jimmy Garoppolo. We need somebody better than him. And they give up all that stuff, and they get a guy who's not going to be ready, so it's going to be Jimmy until the guy's ready. I just think that it's just an inherent mess at the quarterback position. Hmm. And now Trey Lance is already injured, and who knows how much longer Jimmy Garoppolo is going to hold on. And I'm concerned that that we're going to see John Lynch on a very hot seat because Kyle Shanahan runs the show. And I think before he would be gone, usually the GM gets to hire two coaches before the GM's in trouble. In San Francisco, the coach is in charge, and he may, he may, to save himself, have to find a new GM who does a better job of helping him set the table because they've just made a bunch of bad decisions. They have a very good team, but they've made a bunch of bad decisions. And if you take out 2019, Rich, their five years have been a major disappointment. I think Peter King said earlier today – they are eight games under 500, even with that spectacular 2019 season. Mike Florio here on Pro Football Talk. A couple minutes left with him right here on the Rich Eisen Show. So um, what is the topic of discussion uh, at the NFL fall meeting with the membership, as it's referred to? What, what is happening? What's on the docket there today? Well, you know, the Sunday ticket thing is very fascinating because there's momentum toward DirecTV keeping – the satellite side of it and someone else having the streaming side of it. And one of the big issues there is the bars out there and the restaurants, they're not equipped to stream like homes are and individuals walking around with their phones. They need that satellite delivery to have the maximum exposure in those settings. So I could see a a hybrid come out of that where it's satellite for DirecTV and streaming for someone else. And people are very interested in what happens with the Sunday ticket package. But, you know, the elephant in the room is the WFT situation. And Peter King suggested in Football Morning in America that they won't talk about it very much in open sessions because, you know, somebody may blab. But I can't imagine there won't be questions of owners. There already have been some. Woody Johnson was asked about it, and he politely punted. But, you know, the commissioner, he does his end-of-meetings press conference, Mm -hmm. and it'll be interesting to see how aggressive the questioning is with all the different wrinkles, all the angles, who, who ordered the code red on John Gruden? Why did it happen during the season, not before or after? What are you doing about the congressional inquiry? There's a lot of meat there, and, and uh, I'll be fascinated to see how many questions he gets on that, on that broader topic of the investigation and the email leakage. Wasn't the Gruden, weren't the Gruden emails in question part of a separate um, litigation that were redacted, or is it possible that that's where those emails came from and what are you also you hearing about what Gruden's next move is going to be I, I I can't imagine that he's not going to just that he's just going to sit and say nothing to nobody forever right like what are you hearing about that about those two subject matters well HBO sent around an email last week with uh, some quotes from their real sports podcast where Andrea Kramer explained that a producer there called up John Gruden out of the blue and he said the truth will come out. Of course, the most common reaction to that is, well, I, 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 it already has come out. 
but I think there's a different truth he's possibly referring to as to how this all went down and why it happened when it happened in the middle of a season when at the latest the league knew about these in June. Now, my understanding is while going through the emails, the 650,000 emails that the league says were all sent to and from Bruce Allen, and that's a lot of emails. That's 178 on average per day, wow. every day for 10 years. But, but assuming that's true, regardless, while going through those, they found the Gruden emails. And I'm told by June they were fully aware of the contents. They may have been aware of them before then and just didn't act on it. But then the commissioner asked some executives to kind of put it all together and give them a summary. And right before the first one leaked to the Wall Street Journal, the league had decided to send a packet to the Raiders. Like, hey, what are you going to do about this? But the fact that it all came to head during the season is just, if you're a Raiders fan, now even though they're 2-0 without Gruden, it has to be troubling this could have happened, you know, in theory, it could have happened in January, and you go hire a new coach, and you just move on. Or you just hold it until after the season. You let Gruden get through the year, and then you hold on. Why did it happen in October? And maybe that's one of the things Gruden's going to try to get to the bottom of. And why him? Why not anybody else whose emails may be caught up in that trove that they refuse to show us, even though we've seen enough of it that I think it's easy to make the argument that, we should maybe see all of it. Mike, appreciate the time. We'll see you on Pro Football Talk every single morning on NBC Sports on Peacock. Appreciate you calling into the Westwood One Halftime Show yesterday and this show today, as Thanks, always. Thanks, Rich. Great talking to you, pal. Right back at you. That's Mike Flora at Pro Football Talk. Must follow. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.